In one of our recent videos, we talked about lithium ion batteries, which have managed to radically change the world around us thanks to their unique properties. And in that same video, we mentioned that while lithium ion batteries are indeed very good, they are still not good enough. More specifically, they have several significant drawbacks that prevent scientists from settling for what's already been achieved and push them to look for new, knobbly, even more efficient ways to store energy. Therefore, the development of new batteries is one of the most relevant areas of activity, involving thousands of scientists and engineers worldwide. Almost every month, the media publishes reports about a new technology that will become the killer of lithium-ion batteries. Unfortunately, the vast majority of these technologies have not yet moved beyond the laboratories or a few experimental prototypes. On the other hand, I would not be quick to bury lithium-ion batteries themselves. Over the past quarter of a century, these devices have come a long way, becoming significantly better, more reliable, and cheaper. The potential for improving lithium-ion batteries is far from exhausted even today. So before moving on to fundamentally new energy storage technologies, it is worth first figuring out what lithium ion technology can still offer us. And that's exactly what we will be doing in today's video. To do this, we first need to quickly recall how lithium ion batteries work. Every lithium ion battery consists of three main components, the anode, the cathode, the electrolyte, and also a porous separator needed to prevent direct contact between the cathode and the anode. In the charged state, lithium atoms are embedded, or as it's also said, intercalated, into the anode material. These atoms are characterized by a very weak bond between the outer electron and the nucleus, so much so that lithium atoms intercalated in graphite lose these electrons, turning into positive ions, while the electrons coexist next to them in a quasi-free state. The cathode is made of metal oxide or multiple metal oxides, while the electrolyte is an organic solvent containing various ions, including positively charged lithium ions and negatively charged ions of other substances that compensate for their positive charge. Lithium ions in the electrolyte tend to chemically react with the cathode material, bonding with it, causing the cathode to become positively charged. In the electrolyte, on the other hand, there is an excess of negatively charged ions, which begin to attract the positively charged lithium ions intercalated in the anode. This restores the electroneutrality of the electrolyte. But the anode becomes negatively charged due to the excess of electrons left behind by the lithium atoms. An electric field is created between the positively charged cathode and the negatively charged anode, which tries to pull free electrons from the anode to the cathode to reunite them with the lithium ions. However, electrons cannot travel directly through the electrolyte and are forced to move along a conductor connecting the cathode and anode. The flow of electrons through the conductor is the electric current, whose energy we use to power various devices. When all or almost all lithium ions and all or almost all electrons migrate from the anode to the cathode, the current stops and we say the battery is discharged but it can be recharged by applying an external electric field in the opposite direction. This field will pull electrons away from the lithium atoms on the cathode, turning them back into ions, and then drive these electrons back to the anode. Inside the battery, an electric field will arise, under the action of which the lithium ions formed on the cathode will migrate first to the electrolyte and from there to the anode, restoring the pre-discharge state. This technology makes it possible to create far more capacious and powerful batteries than almost all galvanic cells that existed before its appearance, but it is not without its flaws. First, we need more capacious batteries. Modern lithium ion batteries can store about 250 watt hours per kilogram of mass, but we would very much like to have 500 to 700 watt hours per kilogram. Essentially, only when we reach such energy density figures will batteries become at least roughly comparable in energy capacity per unit mass with fuel tanks containing hydrocarbon fuel for internal combustion engines. Second, we need more powerful batteries that can discharge their stored energy more quickly to power more powerful electric motors and also recharge faster. Without the negative effects of a sharp reduction in service life that current fast charging methods with high voltages have on lithium ion batteries. 
Third, we need safer batteries whose operation will not be fraught with fires and explosions, even in the event of damage, which does not happen very often with lithium ion batteries, but it still does happen. Lastly, in fourth place, but only in order, not in significance, we need cheaper batteries. Due to the use of rare metals, primarily lithium itself, lithium ion batteries cost about a 150 US dollars per kilowatt hour of capacity, and that is quite a lot especially if we are talking about stationary battery stations, storing electricity generated, for example, by solar panels for use in bad weather or at night. By 2030, green energy is expected to produce around a trillion kilowatts of electrical power, and the cost of the corresponding number of batteries at current prices would be in the hundreds of trillions of dollars. The picture becomes particularly bleak when you consider that the characteristics of lithium ion batteries degrade quite rapidly with use. So we should add another criterion to our list. We need longer lasting batteries. And the saddest part is that while improving one of the battery's characteristics, we must ensure we don't lose out, or at least don't lose too much, on the others. One of the most promising areas of development in this regard is batteries with silicon anodes. To remind you, in modern lithium ion batteries, a graphite anode is used to store lithium ions in a charged battery. The more lithium we can fit into the anode, the more energy we can store. Well, it turns out that a silicon anode can theoretically fit about 20 times more lithium. It seems like a simple solution. Replace the graphite in the anode with silicon, get batteries that are an order of magnitude more powerful, and win the grand prize. Unfortunately, in practice, things are not so simple. By absorbing such enormous quantities of lithium, silicon anodes expand greatly, increasing in volume by three to four times. This in itself is a problem since it's not very convenient to work with a battery that changes size so dramatically during charging and discharging. But that's only half the problem. The issue is that due to the expansion and contraction of the silicon anode during charging and discharging, it experiences severe mechanical stress and cracking. As a result, lithium ion batteries with a pure silicon anode could only survive a few charge and discharge cycles, meaning that the increased capacity comes at the cost of dramatically reduced lifespan, rendering the technology meaningless. Therefore, pure silicon anodes are not used today. Silicon is used as an additive to graphite to increase battery capacity, as Tesla does. Typically, this involves about 5% silicon by mass of the anode, which already provides a solid boost to energy density, although everyone understands that this is not the limit. Today, there are developments that could potentially increase the silicon content in the anode to 20 to 30%, which would increase energy density by 30 to 40% compared to conventional batteries with a pure graphite cathode. In most such technologies, we are talking about embedding silicon nanocrystals into the graphite's crystal lattice. The graphite acts as a kind of supporting framework for the anode while the silicon is its filler and agent for binding lithium ions. Batteries with such anodes are gradually starting to be used in miniature electronic devices like fitness trackers and the like. Still, they are currently too expensive for large batteries, although premium electric vehicle manufacturers like Porsche or Mercedes are looking into the technology. By the way, one might wonder, why not use pure metallic lithium as the anode? Indeed, in it, atoms are also separated into electrons and ions, but there are no intermediaries, like carbon or silicon atoms, which should lead to a significantly higher energy density per unit mass. In theory, up to 1,000 kilowatt hours of energy per kilogram of battery mass. In other words, an anode made of pure metallic lithium would partially dissolve in the electrolyte during battery discharge and then crystallize out of the solution during recharging. The first experimental models of lithium-ion batteries tried to design this way, but nothing good came of it. It turned out that the dissolution and crystallization of metallic lithium occur unevenly. Small spikes of metallic lithium, known as dendrites, form on the anode's surface. And furthermore, during the next charge-discharge cycle, lithium tends to deposit precisely on these dendrites. As these dendrites grow during battery operation, they can puncture the porous separator that prevents contact between the cathode and anode, causing a short circuit. 
and considering that metallic lithium is highly chemically reactive and can react with water and air upon the slightest damage to the casing, it's understandable why a metallic lithium anode has long been considered a very bad idea. Although today, scientists have some developments that may breathe new life into this idea. We will talk about them in more detail in our next video. Alongside experiments with the anode material of lithium ion batteries, more efficient materials are also being sought for the production of their cathodes, where lithium binds during battery operation. The key objective of these studies is to reduce the cost of the cathode and the entire battery as a whole. Until recently, the most common material for cathodes was nickel-manganese-cobalt oxide in various proportions, the so-called NMC cathodes. The bottleneck in this scheme was cobalt, a rather expensive and rare material. The cost of cobalt in the composition of NMC cathode batteries for a typical electric vehicle is about $1,000 US dollars. Moreover, cobalt is quite difficult to mine. Its mass extraction causes significant environmental damage, and it is very hard to extract and recycle it from used batteries for further use. Some manufacturers suggest replacing cobalt in batteries with other metals, such as titanium. These cathodes are collectively known as NMX cathodes. Others propose removing not only cobalt, but also nickel from the batteries, making cathodes from, for example, manganese oxyfluoride. And the latest trend is iron phosphate cathodes. New cathode production technologies are a huge and popular topic, though it concerns chemistry more than physics, so we won't delve too deeply into it. We'll just say that using new cathode materials can reduce the cost of lithium-ion batteries by 20 to 30 percent, and according to some enthusiasts of cathode chemistry, by 30 to 40 percent, which in itself would be an excellent result. The third element that definitely needs modification is the electrolyte, the medium through which lithium ions migrate from the anode to the cathode during discharge and from the cathode to the anode during charging. Highly flammable and capable of forming explosive vapors, corrosion active, leading to a reduction in battery life, the electrolyte is definitely a problem that needs solving, and it is being addressed in several ways. For example, some time ago, Lithium polymer batteries became fashionable, in which the liquid electrolyte was replaced with a polymer gel. This reduced the risk of electrolyte leaks in case of mechanical damage, for example, and in general significantly increased the safety of batteries and their service life. The cost of this was a higher price per kilowatt hour, and in addition, lithium polymer batteries do not perform well at low temperatures. There is a heated debate about whether the advantages of lithium polymer batteries outweigh their disadvantages, and I certainly do not presume to judge who is right in these debates. I prefer to think that practice is the best criterion of truth. And from this point of view, lithium polymer batteries are optimal for powering gadgets and similar devices, but are unlikely to find application in electric transport or stationary energy storage. There is also a more radical solution to the problem, completely abandoning liquid or even gel electrolytes, replacing them with a solid material containing a sufficient number of free lithium ions, a so-called superionic conductor. As a result, we get a solid state battery with an increased lifespan, much safer to operate and resistant to high temperatures. The latter property allows such batteries to be charged with much higher voltages than conventional lithium ion batteries with liquid or polymer electrolytes allowing them to be fully charged in tens of minutes instead of several hours. Furthermore, the use of a solid state electrolyte makes it possible to implement some fundamentally new technical solutions, such as creating batteries with a metallic lithium anode, which we mentioned earlier. However, solid state batteries, especially solid state batteries with a metal anode, already differ significantly technologically from classic lithium ion batteries. So we will examine this technology in more detail in one of the upcoming videos in this series. The areas of research and development listed above are just the tip of the iceberg. No less, and possibly more, effort is being put, for example, into finding cheaper and more economical ways to produce existing and used components, reducing the weight and volume of secondary battery elements such as casings, contacts, and the like. In short, there is plenty of room for improvement in lithium ion batteries, and there is no doubt that these improvements will be made in the near future.
On our channel, we will continue to follow scientific and technical progress in this area. And in our next video, which I hope will be released very soon, we will look at galvanic source technologies beyond the classical lithium ion scheme, and then at non-chemical batteries, where energy is stored in other forms. There will definitely be a lot to talk about in this area. Many thanks to everyone who supports the channel and see you very soon in our new videos.